Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Fellowship Friday for the Church of the Eternally Secure. And praise Jesus. We're all here together again tonight to have fellowship. Let's let's stand up, everybody. Hey, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, yeah. Amen. Constantly pray. Continually in the Bible says, continue instant in prayer. So that means you should always be in prayer unless the prayer is interrupted because you're preoccupied with something. As soon as you're no longer busy with something, immediately your mind goes right back to the Lord. And what better thing to do than to praise him and love him. So uh, I'm excited about tonight. Uh, but before I get started and tell you what I'm going to try to accomplish tonight, a little bit different than usual, let me ask everybody here on the panel to take a minute and say hi to everybody. And I'm going to call on you from, as I see you listed on my screen from left to right, first has got Jesus, Brother Dave. Say hi. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to Friday Night Fellowship. How's everybody doing? I uh, want to welcome the uh, chat room, all the brothers and sisters that are joining in now. I uh, hope you guys had a great week, and all the people on the panel, God bless you as well. Excited to be here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen. Thank you for being with us, Brother Dave. And we got Sister Lisa for the Most High Jesus. Say hi, please. Praise the Lord, everybody. It's good to be with you tonight. Hello to everyone on the panel. Look forward to tonight's broadcast. Yeah, amen. I'm so happy you could be with us. Uh, I, I know you told me last week you uh, were not going to be available, and then, and then it turns out the the whole program had to be canceled because of a uh, uh, Matthias's uh, program going overtime. I decided to not even try to do it last Friday. So, uh, but I'm so happy you could you could be with us again tonight, Sister Lisa. I see uh, Renee is in the chat room. Uh, of course, she has the invitation, so maybe she'll join us. I don't know, but we know that uh, she and her family needs our prayers. Uh, they, there was a death in the family, and I'm sure it's, they're still handling a difficult time because of that. So, Renee, if you can, join us. Otherwise, we understand. Uh, and, and, and next we have uh, Sister Paula. Uh, Want to say hi to everybody? Mm, I don't know if you're saying hi, but your microphone's turned off. Yeah, she's muted. Yeah. Well, maybe she stepped away from it. We'll ask her to say hi uh, uh, again later, okay? Um, all right, let me tell you about a conversation I had with Brother Matthias uh, of, about a week ago, and, and I've given a lot of thought and decided that, uh, um, you know, we, we call this Fellowship Friday, and there some people have brought to my attention that, well, is this really a fellowship? What's really going on? It seems like you've got a, a hierarchy. You've got a panel, and then you've got a chat room, and there's this distinction. And, you know, everybody should know that I, I, I'm personally against any kind of hierarchy uh, in, in a church. Um, so uh, I recognize that there is a, a problem. And uh, what I want to do is uh, take Matthias's advice on this. And that let's make sure that everybody in the chat room is as involved as we can possibly be. Uh, they can be, I mean. So uh, what we're going to do is, is center the conversation around uh, what's going on in the chat room. So I'm going to ask everybody in the chat room to give us your thoughts. Uh, if there's something on your mind, if there's a problem that you need help with, uh, if there's a question, if there's a praise report, let us know. And uh, I'm going to pay close attention to the chat room and ask everybody on the panel to respond to what's going on there. All right. So, but before I do that, let me ask everybody in the panel and uh, give me your thoughts and <laughs> this, I hope, improvement. Anybody? Yeah, I think it's great. You know, we should... Um... <laughs> We should see if anybody that, you know, is in the chat has any questions or has any praise reports or any prayer requests or, uh, you know, just just whatever's on their mind. And, uh, you know, if we can help uh, encourage or address a certain thing, then then uh, we're here for that, you know. Mm -hmm. All right. OK, uh, I see Celine is here with us as, as usual. Uh, welcome here, Celine. Hope you're having a great, uh, a great day. You seem to always be in a, in a good mood, all fired up, uh, uh, defending the, the real gospel. So keep on doing that. And, and I, uh, Ivan Vlogs, hi. Maureen Believes, 
Um, now, if anybody here uh, wants to make a statement uh, that you want us to respond to, put it in all caps. Otherwise, we'll just uh, see what's going on here. Let me ask the, the panelists first here. Um, does anybody have any kind of uh, a praise report that you want to bring to, to our attention? Hmm. Hmm. I'm a little bit surprised. Well, I, I know I got things to, to praise uh, praise the Lord for. Uh, uh, some of you may know my wife was gone for four weeks uh, back east. That's where she grew up. And uh, she's been making annual trips back there every year to visit her family and her lifelong friends. And, and uh, this time she's gone for four weeks, which is the longest trip. And uh, I was quite lonely in the in the beginning, and I, but I appreciate everybody's in the congregations, everybody's attempt to to uh, give me your attention, to, to, to help me out with uh, that loneliness. And I, I greatly appreciate that. Uh, but my wife returned home safely and uh, I'm just so thankful she's, she's back here with me. My constant prayer every day, really, uh, my worry, unfortunately, uh, I do worry. I, I, I'm, I, I really want to listen to the Lord about his, his uh, statement, don't worry. Um, unfortunately, I, I, I still do. And I tend to worry about my wife and son's safety all the time. I'm always afraid something might happen to them. But so thank you, Jesus. My wife returned home safely to me, and I'm, I'm real happy about that. Uh, okay. Uh, we got a praise report in the chat room, Brother Luke. Uh, the guy that Renee said everybody was praying for, um, she got the news that he's cancer-free. Yeah, that is wonderful. I, I did Hallelujah. see. I, I saw the the video that uh, Renee made earlier about that, and uh, of course, uh, uh, we can't make uh, the uh, the person who made the, the kind of the deal. Uh, have you ever tried to make a deal with God? Uh, I know I've done that in the past. I'll I'll tell you about that later if you're interested, but. Sometimes people want to make a deal with God and you'd say, if, you know, I'll believe in you or I'll, I'll do this. I'll dedicate my life to you if you'll do this for, for me. And so this person said that they would believe, uh, be a believer if, uh, if their uh, family member, their loved one was say, uh, cured from this cancer. And now there's a positive result from the cancer uh, treatment. And uh, rather than being a believer, uh, uh, they're uh, they're really uh, crediting uh, science and the doctors and the chemo rather than the, the Lord, and so that's unfortunate. But we know that we can't make him believe. We know he can't make himself believe either. Uh, so uh, I guess we just all, we just keep on praying for his uh, his mind and heart to be changed. Uh, let me ask uh, S Sister Lisa, could you have anything to say about what we've said so far? Oh, yeah, I was thinking about what you said about, um, like, bargaining, where you, you plead with God for something and, and beg him for something. And you promise that you'll either stop doing something or you're going to do something. Um, ain't that the before truth? Our, I'm sorry? Uh, no, I said, ain't that the truth? Yeah, but before I started, well, I, well, I, I grew up in, in the faith. And I was young. So there were a lot of things I experimented with that I didn't know if it was right or not right. I just tried certain things. And that was one of the things one time I remember. And it, no, it did not go my way. It did not go at all what I, what I wanted. Um, it was a, actually a growth experience. And I had to learn to trust in him and believe him for for the best outcome for my life, regardless of which way it went. And that whatever I was going through, he would get me through. And that I had to keep my faith in him, regardless of the trial or tribulation I was going through. Even if it was hard, even if it was ugly, even if it was nasty, even if it was dirty, it was a not down drag out fight spiritually that he was going to get me through. And my faith had to remain in him. It wasn't about, you know, um, bargaining, as they call it, you know, with God to get what I wanted. Hello? Yeah, I can hear you. 
I'm sorry. I tried to uh, turn my microphone off while you were speaking, Lisa, and I forgot to turn it back on. I'm sorry. Um, I, I, I've heard accounts of people, you know, making these bargains, and, and uh, sometimes they keep them, and sometimes they don't. But um, uh, in my case, I'll tell you what happened. It was. Um, let me see. I retired in December of '04, and several years before that. Um, uh, the idea came to me about uh, some kind of a business plan that I was hoping would work. And if it did, that um, I'd be in a position to retire early. And then the free time that I would have could go into ministry. Um, and so I, that's what I asked the Lord, bless my plan, make me prosper. And if I'm able to retire, uh, then I'll, I go into ministry. I didn't even know what kind of ministry I would do. I had no idea that I'd be preaching or teaching or anything like that. But um, it worked out, uh, and uh, I, I was blessed. I haven't had to have a job since December of '04, and uh, you know, so all, all our financial needs are met, and uh, I have. Um, kept my uh, bargain, I guess I would say, and that, uh, but it's, it wasn't a burden. It wasn't something I even felt obligated. It was a, a privilege. I felt, okay, I'm free now. I'm not, I'm not uh, a, uh, what would you call it? A bond servant. When you work for a company as an employee, you got to be there certain hours. You got to do certain things. Uh, and uh, that's a form of being a bond servant. So now that I'm a free man, I can free, I'm free to do what I want. But so I chose to put my free time into, you know, Bible study, street preaching, and then finally getting on the internet and doing what you see me doing now. Um, so sometimes uh, asking the Lord for something and then making a promise in return, I don't, I don't think there's uh, necessarily anything wrong with it. With it, um, uh, Sister Paula, what, what do you have to say about all this? Are you back yet? Yeah, or, sorry about that. I couldn't find my uh, my. You mouse. know, earlier I called on you, asking you just to say hi to everybody uh, in the beginning, and you did, you you weren't there. I guess maybe you stepped away. But here's your opportunity: say hi, and then then respond to anything you've heard so far. Hi, everyone. It's nice to see everybody. Um, I uh, wasn't really paying attention too much because Matthias and was in here talking to me. Um, all I heard was that you were asking questions from the chat or something. Is that what you were talking about? Or praise reports or something? Yes. Your, uh, your wonderful husband uh, and I were talking uh, uh, this last week, uh, trying to f uh, make this more of a fellowship uh, in, on Fellowship Friday uh, to get everybody involved. And so that was our conclusion that we need to try to make it more focused on the chat room. So I'm trying to pay attention and I'll ask everybody else, uh, if anything going on in the chat room that uh, uh, questions or comments or, or that you want us to respond to, problems you have, prayer needs. I did see that Switch321 asked for prayers for his wife's healing. So anybody who did not see his request there, I want to ask everybody to begin praying for Switch 321's wife. I don't know what the medical issue is, but the Lord knows. So keep keep um, keep that in your prayers. Uh, so that's that's it, uh, Sister Paul. That, that's uh, you're kind of caught up. Except I did share an experience I had, uh, kind of making a bargain with the Lord. Did you hear that? Yeah, I did, and I briefly read something. I think Renee was saying about how somebody promised they would believe in God if their family member got better or something. Um, that's like, that wasn't going to work anyway. Cause you can't choose to believe <laughs> it's like saying, yeah. I'm going to choose to believe the sky is yellow. It, you can't do it. Um, but I do have a question for everybody. Um, mm -hmm. just to get your opinion about it. Something I was wondering about, mm -hmm. um, do you think it's wrong to not make a move in your life unless you get an okay from God? Like even something silly. I, I don't know why this is perplexing me for the last couple of weeks, but say I, I have a procedure that needs to be done. Um, like I have a couple, but one would be like uh, my foot. I've had a, a splinter in my foot for the last year. 
I can't get it out. It's not infected or anything. But so say I want to go do this, but I'm really nervous, almost like I want God to say, okay, go ahead, do that. Is that wrong? (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't want (coughs) to make decisions if a, a better way that if he's working on a better way later on. Well, I'd like to call on Sister Lisa. Uh, I'm, I suspect she has some thoughts on that. Sister? Okay. Uh, well, yes, in, in my own personal experience with the Lord, I, there have been times that I have prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed about things, and all I get is crickets. I get no answer <laughs> and and there may be a due date on something that I have to perform or need to take care of. And I've asked the Lord, which way do I go? And I didn't get an answer. And um, I just learned to assess the information as best that I can and make a decision and trust that the Lord will bless me because the Bible says that the steps of the righteous man are ordered by the Lord. And so sometimes uh, when we're doing things, we don't even realize the direction that he leads us into, even by the way the circumstances are set up, is guiding us to make a decision for something. And the Lord will bless us even in that decision. And even if we make a mistake, he still gets us through the mistake. Because whether we make a mistake or we don't, we still have to rely on him to get us through. So, I mean, if you've done everything you can to be prayerful and you've sought the best information and you're making an informed decision, uh, if you feel that you need to act and you're not getting a no, a definite no from the Lord, then I would say act cautiously, but, you know, carefully, prayerfully. If you are feeling maybe a check in your spirit that you shouldn't act, then, then, then don't do that. Because there's times God is very clear. He may, he'll may, he give you a definite like no in your spirit that this is not the right thing to do. You won't feel right about it, and, you know, as I say, in your knower. <laughs> so, you know, you just kind of have to be um, listening for the answer of God. But there are times that you may need to act and trust that he is going to bless. Because you know what you're doing is not sin. Then, then you should be okay in acting. Well, thank you. That that really helped a lot. I know that was a silly question, but no, it's not. No, it's not. I it's just not wanna, silly at all. I want to rely on him for everything, but then I I don't want to be like um, apprehensive to make even the silliest decision. Do you know how you can get like over um, over obsessed with just wanting to do what God wants you to do to the yeah. point? where you're like, I don't know what to do. It's kind of like yes. that. Kinda oh, like yes. That. And that's why I say when you really are just, you have to trust him that when you're going to make a decision that your steps are being ordered by him, I'll be like, Lord, now I've prayed and prayed and prayed about this with you. It's time for me to make a decision. What would you have me to do? And again, it's like I say, I get nothing. I don't get an answer. But it's not a no. It's not don't do anything. And so I just choose from the best of, of what is available that I believe is right. And say, so, okay, Lord, I pray. Sometimes I'll do this. I'll say, Lord, I pray that th- if this is not what you would have me to do, that you block me at, at every turn so I can't do it. Oh, that's because right. I'm not hearing you right now. I don't know if it's the devil blocking me where right. I can't hear your answer, but I'll pray that. And there has been times when no matter how hard I tried to go do something, I was not able to do it. Right, that's a that's a actually a good way to pray about it, because if he's going to see me through regardless of my decision, then if it's something that he doesn't want me to do, I, I think that's a good idea to pray that he would make it not happen. <laughs> right. right. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Right, ladies. Let's praise Jesus. Yeah. Sister Renee is able to join us. Hi, sister. Hey, hey, what's up? I didn't up? want to interrupt you. I was just saying, what's up, hot ladies? So happy to see the ladies here tonight. 
We've got mm -hmm. Paula, Miss Flora, and Lisa, right? Yes, ma'am. And who else we got, Brother Luke? Uh, uh, Dave, and is Matthias here? Uh, Matthias is producing, but he's busy working. But we got yes, Dave, Lisa, uh, Paula, the wife of uh, um, uh, Brother Matthias, and, and uh, we got you and me. That's yeah, it. It, I'm out on the porch, so it's dark, but uh, you guys can hear me. I just, it's hot and bleh, and I threw my jammies on, but I wanted to come in and check with you guys. And I, I love the answer that was given for Miss Paula. I also love your honesty because sometimes it's, it's these thoughts that can um, shake us. You know, hey, am I doing something wrong if I don't act before or should I wait on the Lord before every single, you know, choice I make? And I like how she said the steps of the righteous man is, or, you know, ordained by God. I, I don't think there's really any wrong way on that. Uh, uh, I, I'm... I missed uh, the end of your statement, Renee. Uh, uh, but you're in the dark. But uh, your your light should be shining. Let oh. your light shine. <laughs> huh. That's fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> and you guys were talking about you know making deals. I never anticipated uh, that Sam would believe. For one, as Paula rightfully said, you can't make yourself believe in Jesus, and I knew that. Um, and I I told Sam that what I actually would like to see happen is him be willing to look at the law and the prophets because as a Jew, um, his entire holy book points to Jesus and that if he does that, that without a doubt, there, there there's no way that the, the scriptures won't confirm who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. I really wanted him to, be willing to open up his heart to God and let God show him the truth. Because as of now, you know, he jokes on me. I'm the Jesus freak. He writes me letters from Moses, the lawgiver to Renee, the Jesus freak, you know, joking around about it. And, and I joke with him too, but he knows I'm serious about um, my faith and how much it's affected my life. And whether he wants to admit it or not, when he had fear of losing his dad, the fact that he really he asked me to pray because I'm always offering to, but this time he asked me to pray to the point where he wanted to make sure I had his dad's full name so that God would know who he was talking about. You know, it was really cute. And, uh, and that's a big step within itself, Paula, the fact that he was willing to admit there's a God and that he might be listening. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I told God I would believe in him if he could show me that he was real, like beyond a shadow of a, a doubt. And he did. Yep. How do you do that for you, Paula, Is that, if you don't mind? Um, well, first I had to read the word. I didn't ever know anything. Wow. God said. Um, and then as I was reading it, I just put it to the test. Like, okay, well, you say don't do this and you're supposed to do this. So... I'm going to try this out. I'm going to assume that this is true until I find out that it's yet another lie. Cause I was, you know, waking up to the fact that I had been lied about everything. So I, um, I did what he says to do in the old Testament. He says, come and let us reason together. saith the Lord, though your skin sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And so you, put, you, I, you went to the word. I went to the word and I reasoned with him. I was, when I came across something that didn't make sense, I just said, I don't get it. Like, how come you said this in one part and this in another part? Fantastic. And he, I just waited on him. He showed me in his time and he brought me right, right to him. That's the difference between someone that shut down, like an atheist will read scriptures and go, oh, God's a genocidal maniac. He contradicts himself. And then they start judging God and judging his word, but they're not willing to let God show them anything. Right. Uh, that's, that's, I always wanted to read the Bible because uh, I was an atheist most of my life. I always wanted to read the Bible just to say that I've read the Bible. Right. 
And I started to read it in my early 20s and uh, I put it down because I thought, you know, I don't want to read this unless there's a slight possibility that I may actually believe what it's saying. Ah, you know, Muslims are told not to read scripture because it's got a supernatural curse on it and the devil will trick Muslims into uh, instead of being the Holy Spirit that converts the soul, they believe it's a curse that a witchcraft that's on the book of the Bible because every time a Muslim actually reads scripture, they convert. That's weird because the Quran references scripture. Yes, it does. It says to that uh, to check the people of the book, to check the gospels and uh, uh, the Torah. And so because the Quran actually, uh, the, the scriptures contradict the Quran, now they say our scripture is corrupt. Yet we have the same scripture we had long before. We can even show it's dated long before the Quran ever existed. Yeah, so uh, they can't it. show where ours is corrupt. So they just, that's their lie. Just flat, oh, it's all corrupt. That's why it disagrees with the Quran. And then it says the Quran uh, contradicts itself because it says that the Torah and the Gospels are God's word and that God's word will be preserved and that no man can corrupt God's word. So which is it? It's corrupt. Either way, the Quran's false. The, the, the Muslims viewpoint on our Bible is uh, the Old Testament, they don't object to that. But the New Testament, they they say that it's corrupted. And Well, uh, the Old Testament too, because it also objects to the Quran. It also does not confirm the Quran. So all of it's corrupt now. But you're right. Most of the time they say it's just the New Testament. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like the Mormons say that, you know, they believe in the, the, the Bible. Particularly, they say they believe in the KJV Bible, um, provided it's properly interpreted. So that's their way out of everything. <laughs> the way it's properly interpreted, meaning yeah. as long as it, 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 it corresponds with their lie. Yeah. Let me ask uh, uh, everybody to respond to um, uh, Joshua Rivera. Uh, hey, Joshua. Um, oh, by the way, um, Ivan Vlogs uh, has requested that I no longer call him Ivan Vlogs. He, he says his name is pronounced Yvonne. I guess it's Yvonne. So Yvonne, I hope I'm saying it right now. <laughs> All right, uh, and there's a, a question from Joshua Rivers. Joshua, you know, that's another name for Jesus, right? Joshua is Yeshua, is Jesus. Uh, but uh, Joshua what do, says, what do you think of a saved Christian becoming a Navy SEAL all for God's glory? Um, I'll ask everybody to answer it, but I'm not sure uh, about the all for God's glory part. Um, I, I wouldn't have any objection to anybody being in the military uh, if, if that, that's what they want to do, if they feel patriotic and led to, to do that. But all for God's glory, I'm not sure I could attach that uh, to it, make it connect the dots there. Uh, what did, What do you have to say about that, Brother Dave? Well, yeah, I answered him in the chat. I said, if that's something that God is putting on your heart, then you know, go through the necessary steps. And if it's something that, that God is calling you to do, he will open the doors. All right. How about uh, Lisa, Paula, Renee? Do you, have, do you have an opinion on that? Yeah. Uh, whatever you do, do it unto the Lord. I mean, uh, as far as like being in the military and defending our country, uh, God ordains nationalism. He doesn't want a one world government. He likes having nations so that one person won't be, in, you know, men are evil. We just one evil person over all uh, ruling all the world. So he's all for nations. And so uh, I, I don't see why this job would be any different than any other job everything you do do it unto the lord so uh i don't i mean i guess the only issue is well there's guns you might have to kill people if they're trying to take your life there's nothing wrong with one defending your country 
and two, defending you or your loved one's life or your buddy next to you. There's nothing in scripture that says that you're not supposed to do that. You can see all over the Old Testament, uh, David had so much blood on his hands, he couldn't build the temple, but that, that had nothing to do with yeah, I think that the idea of um, uh, self-defense or defending someone else. Uh, maybe, Jesus asked the disciples if they had swords, you know, to defend themselves because he was going to be leaving them. So I, I don't have, if that's the only issue regarding military, then I wouldn't worry about that at all. Oh. Hmm. Renee, I'm wondering if uh, the connection, I, I I didn't hear you for a while and then I started talking and then you were continuing. So maybe your connection is is wavering. I don't know. Yeah, okay. uh, but I was I was saying that uh, I, I think that the Bible, we can certainly get from the Bible that um, uh, we are allowed to defend ourselves. We should be uh, willing to defend someone else who needs our help. And uh, the idea of uh, a uh, justified war in, in defense of your country is justified also. So <clears throat> I hope nobody is against that. Uh, and as, as they say, uh, anything you do, whether it's military or anything, uh, obviously we are ambassadors for Christ. So everything we should do should be uh, keeping that in mind. Brother Luke, uh, I did yeah. have you drop out audioly. I didn't know if it, what was going on. I'm going to come back in. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, how about uh, Lisa? Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I think um, one thing that I would admonish him uh, to remember is that his first primary and most important commitment is to the Lord Jesus Christ and that he doesn't violate the truths that are in this book and compromise to service and if he think that that might happen he may want to reconsider that service the other is that um, there will come a point that he is going to be challenged to compromise and it may cost him everything to stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ so he has to be willing to recognize that could happen especially with the climate of the military these days um, prayer in, in, in Jesus' name, for example, other things, he may be demanded to compromise. Uh, the other is, um, you know, we would have to face this, and I know some people have too, even in, in their daily lives, in their chosen professions. There are times, and I've had it happen to me, where a corporation uh, wanted to come against me for proselytizing. And I had to stand my ground. And it could have meant losing my job. I was blessed that I didn't. But I also researched what the laws were for the state of California, found out what my position with, was. Um, for those that are in California, this might be interesting for you to know. California has what's called Title VII. And it's very explicit in what your rights are as an employee, particularly as a believer in whatever faith so you need to read it if you're in california get it get a highlighter because there's some fantastic stuff that will protect you because i went in there i highlighted those things took them to my employer's human resources department and showed them what the law says and they had to back down they they saw that they did not have the right to tell me i could not proselytize as long as i was not interfering for example with the flow of work uh, and the position that i had i wasn't so it was a unique situation where they didn't want me leaving tracks, but they allowed other people to leave information concerning other events and stuff. And so I stood my ground and they had to back down. But you need to understand when you are a believer, the devil is going to challenge you. Certainly not going to be any different in the military. Okay. All right. Uh, Paula, you haven't given us your thoughts on that. Um, this was a question about whether he should join the Navy SEALs or not. I think it was yeah. he said yeah. that he yeah. feels like the Lord's leading him there. I would say do it. I mean, uh, I don't, I think that you can glorify God in it, most any vocation. Um, but yeah, I agree with uh, Lisa. 
about not compromising your beliefs. I could see that that might uh, be a problem. And, you know, we are supposed to um, obey and respect and honor those in authority above us. But if they are telling you to do something that goes against the ultimate authority, uh, that's when you stand up and that's how you'll glorify God. But mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't think there's any problem with uh, war in general. The Bible says uh, every purpose is established by counsel and with good advice make war. So there's a time for war and a time for peace. But, um, you know, if you do find yourself in a position of actually taking the lives of others, it's in war, it's different from what I'm understanding in the Bible. It's different to take someone's life in war. That's not murder. So I think sometimes the lines can get blurred in the military. So I would just, you know, watch out for that. But yes, I think God can be glorified uh, with you being a Navy SEAL. Absolutely. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it, it, uh, I'm reading more of the comments and it, it seems that uh, uh, the decision has already been made about becoming a SEAL and, and so that's happening uh, for Joshua. Uh, so uh, I hope everybody will just keep Joshua in your prayers uh, because uh, as we know, it's a dangerous world and uh, he, let's pray the Lord keeps him safe and, uh, and, and helps him to, to uh, serve uh, in a way that is uh, glorifying God without compromising in any way his faith. Uh, there's a, another question here from Hendrix that is, uh, Hendrix, this is a really unusual question. Uh, he writes, if you promise to pay someone to do a sin, would it be worse to go ahead and pay them after they did it? or back out on your word. Well, that's a, okay. Uh, anybody eager to answer that, go first. No, I don't have a problem. Let me answer that one. Yeah. Um, you're not obligated to do something that's ungodly. And what you should simply uh, tell them is, you know, when you made that promise, you did so in error and that you cannot honor that promise because it was an ungodly promise and your position now as a believer that you recognize that error and you have to correct it and apologize to them and maybe you can come up with some other thing that's not a compromise of your faith or putting them you know in a situation would cause them to sin that they can be satisfied with but you certainly don't have to carry out an ungodly commitment and something like that uh, I certainly would love to have uh, the gray areas filled in. This is very vague and, and general. Um, maybe if I understood exactly what the, the circumstances were, I'd be a better able to answer it. But uh, and who else wants to, to answer it now? I, I think the question is really strange <laughs> when i'm reading it i'm thinking of you know murder for hire or something because <laughs> i can't think of i mean i can't think of anything else you would pay someone to sin to do a sin well you could you could uh, let's say hire a prostitute and, and uh you're hiring them to commit a, a sexual sin with you and then and then s say i'm not going to Pay, pay you that. I mean, I can see that maybe fitting the scenario also, but it is uh, Hendrix. You, you this I got to admit, I, I, uh, I don't really think I understand how maybe it could happen. It, it, it's not only hypothetical, but I don't, I don't see how this happens unless you can. Uh, will you, will you please, uh, if it's not per personal and you're divulging too much, I don't know if this pertains to you or it's all theoretical. But if you can fill in the, the, the blanks a little bit and tell us more specifics, I'd appreciate it. Anybody else want to uh, take a stab at that one? Okay. Um, all right. Let me, uh, I've, I said what we're going to try to do beginning tonight is to not only engage the, 
the chat room and make sure that this is a fellowship of uh, the, the panel and the chat room, all one uh, congregation. But also, uh, I, I know that uh, some of you I've seen in the congregation for a long, long time. Uh, Victoria Sarton, um, maybe you, you, you have the most seniority or you're up there uh, tied for number one in seniority. You've been uh, participating for a long time and I greatly appreciate you being here and all your thoughts and input and encouragement. Uh, so if there's something that you wouldn't want us to respond to, if there's anything that you have uh, been uh, thinking that you wanted to bring to us, uh, go ahead and do it now. I will also say, I do know that uh, Celine uh, she has made a point uh, many times, and probably everybody's aware of it, about her experience uh, in life uh, uh, in dealing with uh, the Lordship uh, heresy. And uh, she believes the real gospel now, but she has a lot of frustration because of uh, family and friends that, that I guess are still in this uh, false gospel camp. And uh, so she's, it's very difficult for her to, uh, to deal with that. Um, so <clears throat> let me ask anybody in the chat room if you uh, if you have any thoughts on uh, or words that maybe will help S Celine. Uh, she's it's a constant struggle for her dealing with this as a, it's frustrating. I think. Hey, brother Luke, I would just recommend that she, um, you know, continue to, you know, re refresh her mind. You know, the the chapters in the Bible of Grace and. And if she ever encounters a situation where, you know, she's running into uh, any legalism or anything like that, that she gets very familiar, you know, with those sections of the Bible that she can, uh, you know, recite God's word to whatever situation, uh, you know, she's facing. You're muted, Luke. What, you can't li read lips? What's wrong with you? <laughs> All right. Uh, so does anybody else have any uh, in advice or uh, thoughts on uh, uh, Celine on this issue? I'm sorry. I didn't hear what the issue was. The, 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 the issue is uh, growing up uh, in, a, in a, an environment of the false gospel, but she believes the real gospel and she is always frustrated uh, because she has her family and where she lives, it's, she's surrounded by that and, and trying to cope with that and uh, is a constant uh, problem for her. Um, that just reminds me of when Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and his own household. Um, if that's the case, um, she might be frustrated because she's trying to uh, intellectually argue with them and she might not be heard just because when Jesus went to his hometown, he, the Bible says he could not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. They knew him and they said, oh, we know this. We, he grew up here. We know his sisters and his brothers. It was too familiar for the truth to come from him. Um, so I would just keep it in prayer and walk out your faith in front of your family members, not so much um, talking it out because uh, they, your family members do have a really hard time hearing the truth sometimes. Uh, I noticed that in my experience anyway. Yeah, that's, that's very true. And then also, um, I think you need to remember to be patient. Remember to be um, firm but kind in your response as far as where you are in your faith. That they're they're never going to be able to change your mind because of what the, the scripture says. Uh, and then also, if there's a way for you to exhibit what I call you know your blessed assurance. You see, I've had family, family members that were from other religions. One happened to be a Mormon. And I was about 12 years old at the time. And at a family get-together, I guess he had been observing me and my confidence in speaking about 
certain things and some kind of way. It was my great uncle. He came into the kitchen when I was uh, eating Thanksgiving dinner, I think it was. And him and my father and my uncle would always get into these debates at the family get togethers. And so when he came in the kitchen and he started questioning me out, I, I was 12. So I was just thinking, I just want to eat my food. You know, uncle, I don't want to get into a long dissertation. But he asked me some very pointed questions. And one of them was, which, I mean, how, how come you're so sure? I said, because it's what the Bible says simply. I don't have to read anything into it. And the Bible says it's an immutable fact that God cannot lie. And he says, so you're sure that when you die, you're going to be with Jesus? And I was like, yes, that's what the Bible promises. I believe in him, that he's the son of God. He's paid for my sin, was crucified, buried, and resurrected on the third day. Jesus himself, who cannot lie, said, if I believed in him, he's going to save me. And that it's eternal life. And I just continue. I'm, I'm literally saying this as I'm eating. <laughs> so you know, I, was, I feel like he was just disrupting me. But. Uh, years later, it was many, many years later. It was about, I was 12 and I think I was about 38 and he came back and, uh, we got on a phone conversation and I had found out maybe about two years after that, that he got born again because my dad came into the room and was rejoicing about the fact that he got born again, but I never knew what happened. So years later, uh, he was much older. I'm much older. And I asked him one time on a phone conversation, I said, well, what changed your mind? And he said, you did. And I was shocked. I had no clue that I had influenced him in any way. And I said, well, what do you mean I did? What did I do? He said, your confidence, you were so sure about what you were saying. I was looking at your eyes. You, you, were, you were sure that you were going to be with Jesus. You had that. And I didn't. And I wanted it. And so he believed on Jesus and got converted. I said, well, you have it now. He said, I sure do. So, you know, that is one of the biggest things that will draw people who are from other faiths. When you exhibit that you have absolute confidence of where you're going to go when you die, because they do not have it. They're in a false way. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I want to say that uh, um, I think it was Paula that, that said that uh, even Jesus said a prophet is not honored in his hometown. And I know Matthias has acknowledged that. I, I, I've acknowledged it uh, as a fact that um, if you're too close to them, especially if they've observed your life and they've seen... Uh, that, uh, hey, you're just an ordinary person like everybody else. Uh, what makes you uh, an expert on this? Why should they listen to you? Um, whereas um, if someone comes in from out of town, uh, they can be easy, more easily accepted as maybe an expert from uh, another city or something. So um, you, you may have a lot more success uh, in, your, in your witness and... Uh, uh, gospel message uh, to people you don't know uh, rather than the people who know you that well. However, the people in your family and your friends, uh, I would say the, the best, best witness is, is not necessarily what you say because they're going to say, well, who are you? You know, they don't respect your, uh, your uh, authority. Uh, but what they can do is observe you for five years or 10 years. And I've seen a lot of people observe me over many years, 33 years now coming up in December, that I've been a uh, Christian. And uh, I know a lot of people have seen the change, and not only in uh, the way I think and, and act, but also in the way my time is being spent in this ministry. It hasn't waned. It was not a passing fad uh, that I went through. Uh, and um, that kind of uh, testimony has more weight on your family and friends than all your apologetic arguments, I would say. Your brother David, have you spoken on this? Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. 
Sorry, did I had you? to run and get a. I had to run and get a glass of water. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, did you? If you didn't hear me, then I'll. I'll um, I caught the end of it. What were you saying? It was too long. Oh, I can't repeat it. It was too, too long of a story to say again. Um, let me That's ask. Right. Um, uh, let me see. Someone else had a question here about the lukewarm. Um, who wants to explain the verse in the Bible that talks about be hot or cold, not lukewarm? Uh, I will if no one else will okay, go. go. Go ahead. Go ahead, Paula. And this is just my opinion on this. Um, I don't know what the church father's opinion on this or anybody else. But what I get from it is um, the hot, the lukewarm, and the cold. The Lord said, I would that you were either hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. And so when I hear lukewarm, I always think of yeast or leaven because that is the condition where the yeast will grow the best. The cold water, the yeast will still grow. It takes a really long time though. And if you put it in hot water, it will kill it instantly. So the lukewarm, uh, I believe, are the Christians that are not truly saved. I believe the hot represent the saved people. The cold are the atheists, the just out and out, you know, people of a completely different belief system. And I think the lukewarm are the majority of Christianity, unfortunately. And when this question came up, I think on a Sunday broadcast, and I was thinking about it when you guys were talking about it. Um, when I read... I will spew you out of my mouth. And I think, okay, what is he talking about? Because the body is all believers and Jesus is the head. So what is coming out of him? And I thought of vomit because you vomit out of your mouth. And what that to me, I know that sounds gross, but what to me that is, it's these people that are inside the body of Christ, but they're not of the body because you can have the contents of your stomach come out of you and you're not losing any part of your body at all. It's in fact, shouldn't be there if it's coming out of you. So that's just how I take it. Um, mm -hmm. That's hmm. interesting because I, I personally have a, I think it's a little similar as to where I see when Jesus says that he wishes that you were either hot or cold. He doesn't, I don't see him specifying that hot or cold is bad, but you know, hot has its uses, cold has its uses, but lukewarm is basically good for nothing. And kind of like what Paula just said, I kind of see uh, that within the church body, since the letter was written to the churches, um, I see Jesus giving a warning that, you know, those that are inside the church that are lukewarm, he says in the next verse that they're, you know, well to do, they're, they're, uh, you know, they say they're rich. They have no need of nothing. They they don't really know spiritually that they're dead, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And so I think Jesus is, is calling those who are in the church amongst the saved believers who aren't saved to repent and put their faith on him to be saved. That's the way I read it. Yeah, and the other thing about the cold, because someone had said to me once, well, you know, that doesn't make sense because why would he prefer them to be cold? If hot is believers, lukewarm are um, uh, the majority of Christendom and the cold are the atheist, I think to myself, well, it's easier to deal with an atheist than it is with someone who's playing the game of Christianity because they're, they're Judas. They look just like us. They talk just like us. Um, they're good people. They're, they think they're following God and they are, they're disciples of Christ. All of these branches of Christianity can claim that they're following Christ because they are in their own way. So it's harder to get to those people than it is to the cold, to the just out and out unbelievers. They know where they stand. They don't believe in God. That's just how I think of it. Mm-hmm. Let me say this, the, uh, 
you, you probably all heard me talk not only recently, but many times over the years about the book of Revelation and the style of writing and the fact that I, I, I believe we should not uh, form our doctrines on the book of Revelation. Let's just listen to the different answers you're getting just on this question alone. If we went through the whole book verse by verse and asked everybody in the congregation here to respond, you're gonna to have tons of different interpretations on all the verses. And so because it's, uh, it's written in a symbolic language, it's called apocryphal style of writing, uh, it's subject to all kinds of interpretation. I don't know if there's anybody here who studied it any more than I have trying to understand it. I, I've listened to experts from every theological camp uh, um, or eschatological camp. Um, uh, I, I've gone through it verse by verse with the, the, the teachers, all the best experts of all the different viewpoints. And so I, I, I've tried to, to learn it, but I really came away uh, unconvinced that I was could be right, could speak on it with great confidence. So I think it's risky. Uh, there are a lot of verses in the Bible that, that are very clear and explicit, particularly about the person of Jesus and the means of salvation. It's clear, we, it's not hard to understand. This is where we get our doctrine. But um, the, all the verses uh, anywhere in the Bible, especially in Revelation, that are written in that style, uh, let's be careful to not get form dogmas and, 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 and say, thus saith the Lord conclusions uh, on that book. I would, that's my advice. But I will say historically, from what I've learned, is that in Laodicea, at that time in history, uh, there was a river, uh, the water supply was uh, known, well known for being lukewarm. Uh, it wasn't like a river that came down from a mountain that was, you know, really, uh, you know, chilled. Um, uh, and um, people who would come in from some other place and they drink the local water, they were disgusted with it because, uh, uh, you know, as you know, and I think back then and even today, uh, if I served you a drink, uh, you'd ask for either an ice drink or a hot drink. We don't like lukewarm drinks. So the, the hot or cold just means that it's, it's, so it's good. And the, the lukewarm means it's, it's not good. Now, does it doesn't mean law and grace, maybe, I don't know. Uh, the, the only thing I can say about the, the, the Laodicean church is that the main issue, if I'm remembering correctly, is that they lost their first love. And there is a, uh, well, I'm seeing the screen blurry. Can anybody speak to me now and tell me, can you hear me? Because the screen's blurry. Is the connection still working? Yeah, we yeah. hear you. Oh, okay. Um, the, there's a, um, uh, the, the Laodicean church, uh, and, the idea of being um, lukewarm and le losing their first love is that uh, you, there's. I remember seeing a card that had my wallet. I had my wallet uh, for a while, and it's a picture of Jesus standing and knocking on the door. Uh, a picture of Jesus, you know, at, at the door of the church, knocking on the door. But uh, um, uh, see, Jesus is not in that church. Uh, it's all about prosperity preaching. It's about all kinds of other things, um, and, but it, but the first love is not part of it. They forgot about the first love, the 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 the, the person and w finished work and the promises of the Savior Jesus. Uh, he's he's kind of left out of it. He's he's not even in that church. So um, that's the setting I think that we get from the, that particular uh, church and the, the, that that portion of scriptures. Any more than that. I can't make a conclusion. Uh, I, I just don't have enough confidence. Uh, who hasn't spoken on this yet? I want to take a turn. Oh, I haven't. Uh, Lisa, what do you think? Yeah. Well, through the years when I would examine that scripture based on other scripture and the context of scripture and looking what God's desire is that none should perish, that is his will, that none should perish. I've heard perspectives that, that I'm probably in agreement with that this is my take on it, which is that if you've heard the scripture where it says um, that he'll blot out a person's name from the Lamb's book of life, for example, or their name is not found in the Lamb's book of life, 
it wasn't found written. I've heard perspectives that say that because it's God's hope that everyone will be saved, that everyone will be born again, people's names all start out in the Lamb's Book of Life. And if they die having not received Christ, their name is blotted out. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. It's an interesting perspective. But in considering that perspective with Jesus saying that if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. I would that ye be hot or cold. Uh, there is a scripture that talks about those who their the love of many would wax cold. Well, the many that he's talking about are believers. I believe in in, in context, and so uh, the, the that's why the Bible warns us about the cares of this world and things like that that can cause a believer to become even more carnal than they than they should be in this world. And so I wonder, and I, like I said, I'm not ready to die on die on a hill concerning this, but that when he says that if they're lukewarm, it's because the person has not made a decision for Christ. They have not believed on Jesus. And so he has no alternative but to spew them out of his mouth. The time that this is happening when he's judging the churches, this judgment that is coming is, uh, you know, judgment begins first at the house of the Lord is prior to him judging the world. And he judgment begins first at his house. So if you're not his, you're going to get spewed out. Uh, it's not unlike all the people he's bid to come to the wedding. They're not coming. And there comes a time when he closes the door. And so I see it in, in, in light of those things. That the person is cold, they're still saved, they just, they're cold. And then you got the people who are hot, we always term as on fire for Christ, right? So they're hot. But the people who are lukewarm are people who have not chosen one way or the other. That, that, Can't makes, hear you, Brother Luke. that makes sense, and that's the way that I've uh, interpreted it for a long time. As I said, I just don't have as much confidence as many people do about that book anymore because I'm. Uh, see, there's certain verses and doctrines in the Bible I have absolute certainty. I have no doubt at all about who Jesus is and the, my, the gift of eternal life I have. But then there's other subjects and verses in the Bible where I have a high degree of confidence, but I'm not certain. And then there's others where I'm absolutely, I just don't know. I just cannot, cannot you know, figure it out or I have confidence that I'm right. Uh, I hope everybody can admit also that, that uh, we are all fallible and, and, and none of us are um, omniscient. Um, but I do like to continue, I continue to like to hear other points of view, especially if someone ever disagrees with me. Uh, that's when the conversation gets interesting to me. Uh, listening to somebody agree with me, well, I don't need someone to agree with me because I already know that. <laughs> if someone has a different point of view, that's what I want to hear and consider. Uh, all right, let's see, anything else going on in the, fat, uh, the, the chat room? Maureen, uh, why don't you present a question to us, Maureen? A question or a point that you want us to respond to? Oh, what do you guys think about tithe from uh, Lipa Jalina? Tithing. Uh, okay, how about Brother Dave? What do you have to say about that? About tithing? Yeah. Oh, I think they got it all messed up these days. I. I'm a believer in the New Testament free will offering. Second uh, Corinthians says, give from a cheerful heart. You know, I think that God, God wants us to be a good steward. He doesn't want us to be, uh, you know, imbeciles. And, and he doesn't want us to give away our rent money, uh, expecting some kind of blessing back or listening to some preacher saying you're going to get a uh, double portion or 10 times your blessing, just sending in all the money. Uh, I think we ought to, we ought to take what we can afford and, and, and give, uh, you know, graciously unto the Lord and his work. Uh, if you have a local fellowship or if you have, uh, you know, um, a local congregation that you serve or are a part of, yeah, you should you should freely and uh, cheerfully give towards that, the work of the Lord, and give also to um, others that are in need. 
Brother Luke, if I could chime in, because yeah. after I, I give this answer, I'm, I'm going to have to go regrettably, but okay. uh, I would like to answer this before I leave. Um, yeah, tithing is not for the church. Uh, it's clear in the scripture. It's never even mentioned once in the new covenant concerning tithing. We're supposed to give free will offerings. Tithing was for the nation of Israel. It's not for the church. And these preachers have misrepresented some, I believe, well-meaning, but still <laughs> sincere, but sincerely wrong. It's not for the church. We're supposed to give freely, either out of our abundance. And, and, and it's not even only giving monetarily. There's a lot of things that you can give have nothing to do with money. So, uh, you know, a person needs to keep that in mind. Sharing a gift that you have that the Lord has blessed you with. Um, there are people who have gifts, for example, that are organizational skills. And if they've um, decided they want to help a brother or sister with something in their life that they can help them with regarding organization, that's a blessing. That's giving. So we shouldn't just always look at it as money or monetarily. There's a book by R. Renee, and it's not Sister Renee Rowland. <laughs> There's a sister named R. Renee who wrote a book called The Tithing Hoax. It's an excellent book. She goes and she shows from the Old Covenant where it was for the nation of Israel and she contrasts with the new covenant and what the teachings are concerning giving and shows you that it is not for the church. It was for the nation of Israel. And on that, God bless everyone. Blessings to you all. I do have to go regrettably. All right. Thank you, Sister Lisa. We'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us. Um, I would say amen to that and also acknowledge that uh, Sister Victoria uh, expressed it in the same way, but let me read it because it was stated very well. Let me see, where is it? Uh, oops, where is your comment, Victoria, on it? Uh, Victoria. Is it the under okay, here, here. covenant? Yeah, that no, one. here it is. It says, it says uh, Tithing was for the Levitical priesthood, and it was mostly food and goods to support them as they served the Lord in the temple and did not hold other jobs. It's not for us under the new covenant. I think, you, Victoria, you stated that perfectly, and it's, as I see it. And I would say that um, we need to keep in mind that the nation of Israel was a theocracy. Uh, and in a government, all governments impose a tax. And this was kind of a, the tax that everybody paid a 10% tax and it went to support the running of the government, which was a, run by the priesthood is, and, and that uh, the priest, the, the Levi's tribe did not receive land or money as uh, the other uh, uh, 11 uh, did, uh, the sons of um, J Jacob. Um, so out of the 12 sons, the one son, Levi, he was appointed to be the priesthood from his family line. And they had to, since they were not given any uh, land or money, they had to be supported, but there it was their charge to run the, the theocratic government. So that money is kind of a tax that people paid to operate the priesthood, as Sister Victoria said here, to provide all their needs. Um, that's kind of a concise answer, but yeah. And now regarding giving today, everybody's exactly right that we're, there is no formula for giving uh, any percentage that's dictated to us. There's not even a command that we have to give. There is um, the um, admonition or the exhortation for us to be cheerful givers and to give uh, as much as we're able for the needs of the church. Okay, uh, who hasn't spoken on that yet, uh, Paula? Have you said you didn't say anything about that? Um, yeah, I would just uh, say uh, Hebrews 7, the entire chapter is talking about Mel Melchizedek and it's talking about tithing and why the tithing was. And I believe the chapter does explain that it's been disannulled. Um, the verse, uh, verse, 18 says, for there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. So I, I, I think tithing has definitely been disannulled, but God does want you to be a cheerful giver. 
but I would lean on his leading for that and not the tithe. Oops. Okay. Um, I've been, I'm trying to respond as much as I can to the questions and thoughts in the chat room, but uh, let me also just ask everybody here in the panel also, if there's something on your mind that you want to bring to, to the, um, into the discussion. Uh, uh, praise report, anyone? Uh, uh, needs? Uh, a subject that needs to be discussed? That, uh, let, let me know. Mm hmm Other than that, uh, I'm seeing, uh, I see a lot of people here who are here all the time. And uh, again, if you're here all the time, then I, I, I refer to you as the congregation. If you're here uh, for the first time, uh, uh, I want to acknowledge you. Uh, I everybody seems familiar as I'm looking through the chat room. I I recognize all the names. I think uh, so. If you are here for the first time, if you make a type something in bold print saying I'm here the first time, so we we know who you are and we can welcome you. Uh, I rely on the moderators to recognize when someone's new, and and just as a local church has their. Uh, there are deacons and so on that, that are the greeters in the church. Uh, I rely on the moderators to greet the, the new people and make them make them welcome. So um, let us know if you're if you're new. Otherwise, uh, regular members, are, we're thankful that you're here all the time. Uh, okay, uh, so we got uh, Paula and Dave and myself and Matthias is busy working here. So. Uh, is there anything on your mind to Paula or Dave that you want to, a subject you want to bring up for discussion? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, um, I just wanted to make mention that I, I thought it was a great idea that you, um, you know, we're taking questions from the uh, chat room. Um, seems not a, not a lot of prayer requests came in. Let's just all remember to uh, pray for Switch and his wife. Pray for uh, Joshua and his decision, and the uh, pray for Sister Renee as she uh, continues to deal with the uh, family tragedy. And uh, you know, it's, I just want to say, Luke, that it was a you know it was a good idea that um, allowing the chat to to have questions and and us uh, try to encourage them or answer them or, or take their prayer requests. So it was a it was a good idea and a, and a different change up, you know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Brother Dave. I. I and uh, it was uh, it was the result of uh, some criticism that I considered in discussing with Matthias. Uh, we thought, well, maybe we can designate one of the moderators to be kind of like the intermediary to between the chat room and, and uh, the, the panel. But I thought, after thinking about it, I thought, well, why can't we just do it directly? Let's just make sure that we are paying attention in the chat room and responding to their your thoughts. Um, so uh, I'm glad that we're doing it. Uh, uh. Right, Luke, I think it's great. And actually, if you, you know, you're letting people know that I guess this is the format now that you want to go with. Um, yeah. So they can prepare questions because I know uh, when I first started to, sorry about that. Um, to uh, this one church, I realized at the end of the teaching session with the ladies group, the leader, the head woman would ask if we had any questions or, you know, and we would all just be kind of like dumbfounded and we'd, we wouldn't know what to say because we hadn't prepared for it because we had prepared to just sit and listen and not bring our own issues to the conversation. So the next time, you know, we thought about it and we all had, you know, things we wanted to bring up. But I think it's just uh, how you're talking to the chat now and saying, does anybody have any questions? Everybody's just like, uh, probably, but I can't think of what they are right now. <laughs> yeah, 
Good, good point. So uh, let, let's remind everybody in the chat room now, and let's keep let's keep this as the protocol and kind of the format for the Fellowship Fridays. In that, uh, if you have questions or any point that you want to make uh, and you want to be the subject of the discussion, I have them ready. Hey, Hendrix is back. I'm glad you came back, Hendrix. I hope you can go, didn't uh, go leave uh, mad. I know you didn't really, but. Uh, um, there's there's really no question. I, I remember um, a couple of years ago, we had someone ask a question on a Sunday, and we happened to have somebody on the Sunday panel that was not normally with us, and that particular person doesn't really um, uh, is not known for diplomacy, and so they referred to the question that was asked as a stupid question, and I I tried to calm things down and. I would say that there's no such thing as a stupid question and that uh, uh, so uh, I hope I didn't give you that impression. I just didn't really understand it necessarily, but I hope that we uh, we, we satisfied you and, and the question, Hendrix. And Hendrix, I, I, I refer to Hendrix as the captain of the moderators because of his faithfulness in the chat room and his great judgment. He, he has really great discernment to recognize how to deal with the problem, he, uh, uh, how to uh, connect the chat room with the panelists, get our attention, uh, how, how to uh, enforce the rules when necessary. Hendrix, you're really a model for that. And we're, you're greatly loved and appreciated. I appreciate all the moderators. Uh, so, uh, all right, I guess we're getting close to 11 p.m. I want to try to end it by 11 because it's 11 Eastern, it's getting late. So uh, um, let me ask uh, if there's any final question in the chat room, bring it up now. Uh, we'll maybe answer one more question. Also take uh, take a minute now to let any of um, the uh, remaining panelists here, uh, Sister Paula and Brother Dave, uh, kind of sum up your, your thoughts on the time tonight. Uh, we'll go with... Sisters first, Sister Paula. Um, yeah, I thought it was good. It was fun. Um, uh, every time I have one of these discussions, I always learn things. And I like that we can uh, each share our views about what we read in scripture and that the chat can also chime in on that because honestly, I think that when it comes to like the revelation and, you know, peculiar passages, I think probably nobody has it a hundred percent. They're not, they're not interpreting it a hundred percent right. And it's probably little bits and pieces of all the believers that how it's how it's going to play out. So I, I, like you, Luke, am always interested in hearing other people's points of view um, because then it really makes me think. And I don't have, this is the important part, I don't have a pet doctrine. So that makes it really easy to consider other people's point of view. And sometimes I change my mind if they do have a better argument, and I do see that in scripture, but also if I can see how I was thinking fault, faulty in the first place, that's great. Um, it only becomes a problem if we hold on to our pet doctrines when they're non-salvific, have nothing to do with salvation. That's really uh, the only problem I see in being able to share our differing views is wanting to hold on tightly and be right. I'm okay with not being right. I was wrong my whole life and thank God he showed me. So now when other people bring up stuff that the father has said and I haven't even really paid attention to it, it's great. It's, it's awesome. And um, I think some people, it tugs on their pride a little bit. And it really shouldn't, because if we can see it in scripture, I mean, God is amazing. And I don't think any of us have it down 100%. So, you know, when you close yourself off and you say, I got this, I know how it goes, you know, you're probably wrong. <laughs> it's more fun to have an open mind about it. So uh, I really enjoy your programs, uh, Luke. So, and thank you for inviting me on. 
All right. Thank you, Paula. Uh, obviously, I can say amen to that. <laughs> um, Yvonne uh, is asked to answer one last question, and, and I'll read it, and uh, then I'll get uh, Dave's uh, summary thoughts and answer the question, too. Uh, Yvonne writes, when you preach the gospel, do you have to tell the person to confess Jesus as Lord with their mouth in order for them to get saved, uh, even though God knows the heart? Uh, Brother Dave, why don't you answer that first? It would, <laughs> somebody would ask a question like that. Listen, I'm not going to put no specifics on nothing. God knows your heart. You turn to Christ. You turn to the Lord. The Bible says very specifically, I'll go in John 6, 47. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever believeth on me hath everlasting life. So, you know, I'm not going to sit there and tell anybody, hey, this, this is the exact formula. That's the exact formula. I'll tell you to turn to Jesus Christ, call out to him, put your faith on him, seek God, and, and you can't go wrong in that. Mm -hmm. Okay, amen. I, uh, I'll answer it next. Uh, it doesn't take long to answer this question, but... Uh, I will say uh, the answer to your question bluntly, uh, succinctly is no. That's uh, I would not do that. Uh, uh, I, I, I agree with Matthias on this idea of making having people make a decision is wrong. I've never done that in 33 years. I've always presented the gospel and uh, never asked a person to decide to believe because you can't decide to believe. Believing is something that just happens. God does not make you believe. You do not make yourself believe. Believing is something that happens at a point in time when you actually become convinced that something is true. That means you now you believe. So uh, all I can say is that um, I would present the gospel uh, and not ask them to say a prayer or uh, you know uh, confess with their mouth uh, in any way. Um, all, all I would ever ask someone after that or anybody tonight right now, I would say... Uh, are, are you certain you have eternal life? Are you certain you're going to heaven? And why? And if a person says, I'm certain I have eternal life, I'm certain I'm going to heaven, and it's only because of the, what Jesus has done for me, it's only because of his promise to me that I have this confidence, this assurance, uh, then then I would be satisfied. Uh, but... Uh, uh, I'm not going to ask them to say a prayer or, uh, you know, verbalize anything other than just their confession of faith that they believe. And uh, if a person does believe and then they, they want to say a prayer, my, my idea of a sinner's prayer or prayer for salvation is, is uh, uh, once we believe, saying, Lord, thank you. Thank you. I'm saved. We, we pray a prayer thanking Jesus for saving us, not asking him to save us or not, uh, you know, uh, you know, a, a, product, a, a procedure, a religious formula to try to get your salvation. Um, okay, Sister Paula, what do you say? Um, I would say when you preach the gospel, you shouldn't be looking to close the deal. Uh, we water and plant, it's God who gives the increase. Um, you might be talking to someone and preaching the gospel and for uh, you know several years before that they've learned bits and pieces and you're there at the moment when they actually do come to a full saving belief but the way i think that the church system uh runs soul winning is to go out and get check marks and decisions and just because you've decided to follow jesus or look into him or become a disciple that's not salvation because you don't decide when you're going to get saved. You seek the Lord until he reveals his truth to you, until he gives you the understanding. So um, if they believe in Jesus, they will confess with his mouth or with their mouth that he is Lord. So you don't have to get them to do that. And I think, I think thinking that you have to get them to do that might confuse them and make them think that just saying those words is what saves. And it's not, it's not a prayer. It's not uh, walking down the aisle. It's not even asking the Lord to save you. It's learning of him 
learning to trust him and waiting until he shows you that he already did save you and you believe it. Yeah. So, Amen. So. so the, uh, the idea of going forward, an ultra call that was popularized by Billy Sunday, it was called the sawdust trail. You'd walk out the, the tent the floor was covered with sawdust and people would walk forward. Uh, and, and then, then it was uh, also done in another way by Billy Graham, where they asked people to come forward, make a decision for Christ. Uh, these things are not biblical. It's not the right uh, way, I think, to uh, do evangelism. Uh, you just tell them the good news, and now it's between them and Jesus. Maybe they'll believe now. Maybe they'll believe next year. Maybe they'll never believe. We can't impose it on them. God will not impose them on them. God will not prohibit them from believing. So, okay. Uh, I guess that's it for tonight. Uh, I enjoyed the time with everybody. Thank you, uh, Paula and Dave, for being with and, and Sister Lisa, too. Was there somebody else who was here that I'm for, forgetting? seemed like there was one other. I guess not. Uh, all right, thanks for joining us. Uh, don't forget to join us uh, uh, Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern for the Church of the Eternally Secure Sunday service. Uh, thank you, congregation. Thank you, um, uh, moderators. And bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus. <laughs>